If you're still using mutable collections just so that you can build out their contents programmatically, it's time to consider using Kotlin's collection builders. In this video, we're gonna take a look at what they are, why you might wanna use them, plus we'll also take a quick look at immutable collections. As you know, it's easy to build out a collection if you know ahead of time exactly what needs to be in it. For example, here I've got a list of strings that builds out an abbreviated table of contents for a book, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I simply used the list of function and passed it all of the strings that I wanted to include in the list. So that's easy. But things get a little more complicated when we need to build out the list programmatically. For example, it's more likely that we've got a model for our book, maybe one that looks like this. The content class here represents a section of the book, and it includes a title and page number. If we want to build out a list of strings for the table of contents dynamically from this model, it's going to take a little more work than what we did over here. One approach is to concatenate multiple lists together. Here's how that might look. This function accepts a book title, a list of content objects, and an optional copyright string. First, we create the list for the heading, so the title, the table of contents, text, and the horizontal rule. Then we do a map indexed, which transforms each content object to a row in the table of contents, and add that to the first list. Then we add a horizontal rule to that list. And finally, if we have a value for the copyright, we add a list that includes an empty row for spacing plus the copyright notice. Otherwise, if copyright is null, then we just append an empty list, which effectively leaves the list unchanged from there. To run this, we'll just create a main function. I'll pass the title, contents, and copyright date. And this book is actually in the public domain, at least in the United States, but I'll give it a copyright date just for the sake of demonstration. And then for each line in the TOC list, we'll call print line. Here I'm using a function reference, but this is effectively the same as if we had just called print line inside of the Lambda. And when this runs, we'll get the same list of strings as we had in our hard-coded list at the beginning of the video. Now this isn't the worst code I've ever seen, but there's some stuff I'm not crazy about. It does take at least a little bit of effort to read and understand what's happening here, but it's also kind of wasteful. We're creating a lot of list objects that are used once and then immediately discarded. Let's see if we can figure out how many. Well, first we've got the list here from this first list of. Then map indexed creates another list as it transforms the contents. This little plus sign here will combine those two lists into a new list. So that's the third one. Then we append this horizontal rule to that list, which creates a fourth list. Then assuming that the copyright is not null, we create this list here. And finally, this list is concatenated to the previous one, which creates a sixth list object, and that is the one that is finally returned from the function. So when the copyright is not null, we create six different list objects, five of which were used just inside of this function. So they're created, used, and then left out there for the garbage collector to clean up. For what it's worth, when copyright is null, then this empty list function is called. And this function just references a singleton object internal to the standard library. So it doesn't actually create a new list. In that case, we would have five total lists instead of six. Either way though, that's still a lot of waste. One way to avoid these intermediate collections is to use a mutable collection instead. And here's how that might look. With this solution, we just create a mutable list at the beginning of the function, and then we add to it as needed. For example, we add the heading here, then for the content listing, we use map indexed to instead of just map indexed. The map indexed to function accepts a mutable collection as its first argument and uses that as its destination rather than creating a new list for it. Then we add the lower horizontal rule and optionally add the spacing and copyright notice if needed. And finally, we return that list, which works fine because mutable list is a subtype of list. A big advantage of this solution is that it creates a single list. So unlike that previous solution, we aren't creating lots of intermediate lists just to discard them right away. Also, we no longer need an else case down here. If we don't have a copyright string, this code simply just won't run. Now this has cleaned up the code where we build the list, but we've introduced a new problem. The return type is declared as a list of string, but the actual type that we're returning is a mutable list of string. So once you get that back, it's entirely possible to change its contents. So here I can use 
is with a smart cast to change this back to a mutable list. And then we can change the first element. And when we run this, you can see we've modified the contents. This brings us to Kotlin's collection builders, which include build list, build set, and build map. So let's update our code so that it uses build list instead. I'm going to make the changes first here, and I'll explain what I'm doing in a moment. This looks very similar to our previous solution that used a mutable list, but with a few small differences. We call build list here, which takes a lambda with a receiver. So inside this lambda, the receiver is a mutable list. So we can call add, and we could call it with this if we wanted to, but it's cleaner to leave it off. In the map indexed two, we pass this, which is the mutable list, and then we just return the result of the build list function itself. Now, if you try to modify the contents of this list, you'll get this unsupported operation exception at runtime. So collection builders give you the convenience and the performance of using a mutable collection, but with the safety of not being able to modify that collection after it's been built. Now, you might be surprised to learn that the list of function and the build list function are actually returning two different implementations of a list. List of returns an array list, which on the JVM is just a regular old java.util.array list. Build list, on the other hand, returns a Kotlin implementation called list builder. And list builder is very similar to an array list. It still uses an array as its backing storage. It still defaults to a capacity of 10. It grows incrementally as needed using the same algorithm as a Java array list. So it expands by 50% whenever you add an element when that backing array is full. So what's different about it? Well, it's also got the concept of becoming unmodifiable once the list has been built. So in terms of the effects that it has, it's kind of like taking a Java array list and running it through collections.unmodifiable list. It's got the characteristics of both of those concepts, but just baked into one class. And although I'm usually reluctant to bring up performance characteristics, just because they typically depend on a wide range of things, I will say that you'll often see better list building performance with build list than with the other approaches. Now, I do like the idea of preventing changes to a collection once it's been built, but I'm not that crazy about the idea of exceptions being thrown at runtime. If we say that something's not allowed to happen, like you're not allowed to edit the contents of this list, it'd be great if we could prevent that from happening even at compile time. So let's see what we can do about that. Let's take a look at the list interface. You might notice that the list interface has no functions for mutating the list, only for reading it. So it's easy to think of a list as being read-only, but that's not necessarily true. After all, mutable list is a subtype of list. So it takes the reading functions from list and adds to it some functions to mutate the data. So if you've got a function that accepts a list, at runtime it might actually receive a mutable list, and it might be surprising if the data in that list were to change while that function's running. When we talk about the features of a class, a lot of times we're thinking in terms of the functionality that the class provides. But sometimes, not providing certain functionality can actually be a feature. For example, consider a list that guarantees that its contents will never change. Even though it might not add anything, any functions or properties to the list interface, the fact that it guarantees that its contents won't change is a feature. Currently, Kotlin's standard library doesn't give us any immutable collections, but instead, we can turn to an official Kotlin library called kotlinx.collections.immutable. The idea is that immutable list extends the list interface but adds no new properties or functions to it. It can't be cast to a mutable list, so you can't change its contents. So let's take a minute to demonstrate this. In our Gradle build file, we'll add a dependency on the kotlinx.collections.immutable library here. Note that the Maven artifact ID uses hyphens instead of dots. And then be sure to reload the Gradle project. And then up here on line five, we can change the return type to immutable list. Grab that import. And then down here, we can call to immutable list. There's no relationship between immutable list and mutable list. So now when we do this is check here, we get a compiler error. 
Now, if we use as to explicitly cast this, then we'll get a warning instead of an error. It tells us that this is an unchecked cast, and when this runs, we'll get a class cast exception. So the error still isn't 100% moved to compile time. From here, if we really wanted to, we could set the compiler to treat warnings as errors. So back in our Gradle file, we could do this. Reload Gradle. And now when this builds, we get a compiler error. It's still not showing as an error in the code, it still looks like a warning there. And to fix that, we could change the inspection settings so that it looks like an error instead. But I've worked on a few projects where we used all warnings as errors, and honestly, it was a bit heavy-handed and caused a bit of confusion, but it is an option. Now, even though you can't modify an immutable list, you can cast it to something called a persistent list. And that provides functions with a lot of the same names as mutable list, but instead of changing the contents of the list, they return a new list. And for the sake of efficiency, that list can actually reference some of the underlying data from the first list. So here you can see we've created a copy of the table of contents list, and this copy has the updated title, but the original list hasn't been changed. So that's the idea behind the Immutable Collections library. It's a pretty cool idea, and maybe we can take a closer look at it again in a future video. That's enough for today, though. We'll go ahead and wrap up this one. As always, talk to me in the comments. Let me know how you've been using collection builders, or if you have any experience with the Immutable Collections library. Thanks again for hanging out with me today. I'll see you next time.